China, not one of the top 10, not even top 20. But here you are, Joey, Young China, one of three companies on the index. I mean, why are you going against the grain, going for transparency, pushing the company up there for people to observe? Um, it just happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, we have a lot of uh, amazing founders in Young China in the last 32 years who have worked very hard for this. Um, but I think most importantly, um, we, we have 450,000 staff right now. And that's one thing in common is, I would say, uh, there are probably many things, but one thing in common is none of us is from very uh, privileged background. Uh, if you're from very privileged background, you know, fried chicken shop is pretty hard work. Um, with that in mind, I'm not only talking about gender equality, I'm talking about just having a fair uh, platform for everyone, no matter who you are, which part of China you're from. This is a platform where meritocracy comes and where your hard work will pay off. That's first. Secondly, is um, very long tenure of our staff. Um, recently, I tried to have a lunch with anyone who has over 20 years uh, working uh, experience with Young China, because we only have 32 years history. So 20 years, I thought, is, is, is pretty cool. I spent so much time. And then my, my HR guy came back and said, no, cannot be done. Too many people, a few hundred. You cannot have one lunch with all of them. So we have to up the <laughs> requirement to 25 years to manage the number. But when, when, we, when we can retain our staff for such a long time, then suddenly the, the playing field for that one year, two year child care, childbirth year becomes less important. Um, and then third, I guess, is the merit uh, transparency of the promotion process. Uh, so we have some critical promotion, not every single promotion, there's some critical promotion that will well, move you to the next level. Those promotion process uh, is transparent. Not only your boss, but other uh, department head uh, will be there. Not only to be there to be transparent, but also to, sh to have to share responsibility that for this young man or young woman who we're going to promote, we're going to collectively to help them and make, them, make him or her a better leader. So I think um, the culture, the process, and the background all help. But we are very fortunate, and, um, and we are very honored to be recognized for, for the effort. Thank you. We'll touch on building that culture. Mm. Peter, for now, we talk about data for good. How does data factor into Bloomberg's own diversity and inclusion efforts? Well, we, number one, as you undoubtedly know, and I think Joey is aware of, this is something that is extremely important to us. It's not just the right thing to do. It's a business imperative. We are fighting every day around the world to attract and retain the best talent. We've got to have the best D&I programs and create the best work environment that we possibly can be, to be able to do that. Uh, I, I started leading this effort uh, and went to Mike and our third partner on our management committee five years ago and said, I'm going to put a stake in the ground and it's going to come from the most senior levels of the firm and they are both on board, as you heard Mike speak in the video. Uh, our data was not very good. It was kind of hard in different parts of the firm to figure out the mix between male and female, to figure out some other underrepresented groups. In some countries we declare, in other countries you don't declare. Uh, one of the things that we've done, uh, and this was starting about two years ago, there is a very robust software capability called Vizier, which allows us to really take our workforce and cut it and lot, cut the data in lots of different numbers and lots of different ways in which approaching it. And that has helped us and particularly helped our business managers. We have 17 separate business units that all have diversity and inclusion plans, and they now have a more robust data set to be able to look at that information and help them both tactically and strategically as they go forward with their human capital strategy. Uh, you, Joey, you talked about the culture that's within the company. How do you build a culture? Because right now, apart from Yum China, it's only Lenovo and BYD willing to come on board, be transparent. How do you encourage other companies to do the same? How do you build this culture? 
to promote gender equality? Um, well, the culture happened first. The, the tone from the top is absolutely important. Um, I, I, I'm quite um, optimistic about the future of China because competition is so intense. So when we focus on the folk uh, result, then you know there's a genuine drive to, to have the right talent. Secondly, when you start to have some early role model, that's when the momentum starts to build. Um, many obvious things we, we, we can do, like the education, training, uh, etc. But my, my focus, my personal focus, uh, has been on the more subtle things. Sexism runs deep. Um, there's, there are some subtle things I, I, I like to point it out, and I would encourage everybody to point it out. You don't have to do it in a very aggressive way. Just ask question. Um, ask the question as a kind reminder to change people's heart and mind. To call it out, you mean? To call it out. So, you know, there are certain things we need to recognize. It. Let, let, let's, let, let's try here. For this room, how many gentlemen you have daughters? And sisters, we have a lot more su supporters than we realize we have. Because you know, when you have daughter, you have your sister. Your perspective would might change a little bit. So first of all, let's recognize we have a lot of supporters. Um, secondly, is for something subtle. Um, once you call it out, then then it become process. So I'll give you two example. That when I uh, involved in hiring or performance evaluation. I would always ask question, and then once you ask question, you can see my team was do it systematically. systematically. You know, someone clever joke, uh, just joke. So no offense to, to people who I'm going to offend. <laughs> just a joke. Uh, men get promoted for potential. Women get promoted for results. It's a little bit funny, right? <laughs> Maybe a little bit funny. Well, maybe there's some truth in it, right? Let, let's start there. So what, what, what I would ask my team to do is when we promote someone, can we have a clear list for each candidate? What are the potential? What are the results? Then you compare, right? Instead of maybe not only men and women, just one person out of another person, we all have our own subjective judgment. So we try to try our best to maybe put aside a subjective judgment a little bit, just have a factual comparison. That's one, uh, uh, one, one, one call out. The other call out is when you evaluate somebody, do, you, do we, I'm not only talking about men, I'm talking about women, we, we, do we evaluate people based on what has she or he what, what, what has she done or what has she done? Or you can evaluate some people for what he has not done or what she has not done. Like, if you think, think about it, but this is for ourselves. I mean, the, the, the most powerful thing is to, to reflect upon ourselves instead of just criticize other, other people. When we evaluate our own team, do we do that? I think, again, it, it, it would be very useful exercise just to put it out. When you, do we sometimes also make the mistake that we give C to an A student because of recent improvement, or do we give a C to A student because something is not so, not so perfect about this A student yet? So I think these are the very, very subtle things. Huh? So as, as someone in the corporate, you can be very senior, you can be most junior person, it's totally fine to ask the question. Where are we in the whole discussion, Peter? You sit on several boards. Are boards recognizing the importance of gender equality and how are shareholders responding to it? So I think two ways. I, I think it, I would say that the willingness to embrace gender equality is very mixed and depends upon who is in the CEO or the CEO and chairman of the senior leadership position. Mm -hmm. Uh, as Joey mentioned, and I said this before, setting the tone at the top is the most critically important message to send to the institution that this is really important, we're going to be persistent, we're going to be dogged, we're going to have some successes, we're going to have some steps backward, but we've got to take those in stride 
because this is very much an evolutionary process as opposed to a revolutionary process. Um, the, the, uh, w what I've seen is that the individuals in the 30% club, which I, led, I lead in the United States, we've been doing this for about five years, the rate of increase of female uh, non-executive directors on the boards of public companies, in some cases private service companies, is basically up quite dramatically, and it's largely because the CEOs who are running those businesses have embraced this as a true competitive advantage and a necessity to be able to field a workforce that can go against the best around the world every single day. Uh, and, and there are other examples where that's just not the case because they are not enlightened from a leadership point of view uh, going forward. What was the, there was another part to your question. Shareholders. Oh, the, the other thing that, the, what I've tried to do on the 30% Club is I have systematically gone to some of the big, for example, BlackRock and Vanguard are both members of the 30% Club. I've gone to Larry Fink the head of GSAM and the other big institutional State Street and big institutional holders, and basically tried to enlighten them and the importance they play as shareholders to make change happen, both at the board level but also at the leadership level of companies going forward. Uh, and as we see in the GEI, as we see in ESG investing, uh, the fact that it's become more and more in vogue and more and more important with regard to the allocation of resources and assets, they are playing, I think, a reasonably significant role in helping leadership to drive change in their companies because the owners basically won't stand by unless that change takes place and is manifests itself in better performance. Is there a geographical difference? I mean, do companies in the West embrace it more or do Asian companies? I mean, we were surprised by the poll question earlier where the most equal within Asia is the Philippines. So are there surprises that you've seen when it comes to geographical differences? No, I don't think so. One of the things about Asia, which we've particularly seen uh, in the context of, of the 30% Club, is there still remain very large family ownership in some big Asian countries, and patriarchs are still at the helm of those institutions. And they tend to be less understanding about the relative importance of having a diverse and inclusive workforce than someone in, in Europe or in the United States running a public company. So as I think we'd see in lots of different aspects of business, there are some parts of the world that are more advanced than others. And again, I think it all boils down to what kind of leadership is there and, and the fact that that leadership basically won't take no as an answer. Uh, both of you have talked about how it has to be from the top, and both of you are role models in your respective uh, companies. Can you both speak about some of the things you have personally done. I know in the case of Peter, you've mentored a lot of women I know who are in leadership positions. Uh, we'll get to that slightly later, but Joey, on your part. Uh, um, well, I mean, the, the leadership team, we work very closely together. I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, for, my, for, for my company, the biggest and the, the most important group of people uh, in our culture is our restaurant general managers, the store manager. And our culture is LGM number one. It's very, very clear and we all love it. So uh, every year we will have our LGM conference and this year is end of March and right now we're at the scale of 10,000 people now. So I would, you know, get on the, I did get on the stage for the first time when I s spoke to my LGM uh, after I joined. Um, I addressed the number one concern for my RGMs, whether to quit the job after having a baby or after the Thai second child. Uh, my message is clear. If, you know, if, if some, some of us really felt, feel that being a full-time mother is calling, it's a calling, do it. Do it proudly, not because you're pressured by whatever family pressure or whatever social pressure to it. You do it because you love it. You f feel that this is the calling of your life. But if you feel that you really want to keep the job, have the job and have the family, do it too. Don't be afraid and, and do it proudly as well. It's gonna be tough. Um, you know, it's, it's never easy for anybody, working mom or working dad, you know, same. Uh, 
but it can be done. And also look at the role model uh, to your kids. That is invaluable as well. So, so I will speak freely and not freely. I, I speak with, with my own personal struggle. I will admit it's not easy, but it really can be done. So I think uh, that, that's just one, one small thing. Um, but there are many other things. Um, again, subtle, I would encourage people to think about. Um, I, I would encourage the role models to think about as well, how, particularly how, how the social aspect of corporate life impact the level playing field. Um, it's, it's personal observation, also um, experiences. Um, once you have more female leader on the top, something subtle change. First of all, a lot less company dinners because we have to go home, <laughs> take care of our kids. <laughs> um, if we want to meet, lunch can be done, breakfast can be done, but dinner, let's, let, let's not do it, let's avoid it. Um, for, the, for the idea, I, I work in UK for 10 years, and UK have a, have a long tradition of ha going out for a pint after work, <laughs> right? Um, that would, or that did disappear. <laughs> Again, I have to go home to care of my kid, I'm sorry. So the drinking bit, disappear. And then the third bit also change is golf disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so for, go for those golf fans, I'm sorry, many of us with kids, no golf for the weekend. <laughs> but that's fine. Um, in, in a way, in a very subtle way, it also changed a little bit of the level playing field because the, the social aspect of the corporate life takes time. Um, but if we focus all of our energy on the work, result, um, that, that's, that's nothing wrong about it. I mean, our, our focus is to get the best people to maximize the best result, and it can be done. That's, that's my little learning, Peter. I'm <laughs> sorry, I don't, you probably like golf. Many people here like golf, but I don't do golf, and I'm not gonna <laughs> apologize for it. <laughs> Peter. I will remember that, and I won't hold it against you. <laughs> By the way, I think you made an excellent decision. <laughs> Thank you. What are some of the things you have done, Peter? I mean, well, the the um, I mean, one of the things that I do is I have twelve mentees a year, and I'm now in my this is my seventh cohort that I'm about to go into, and, and the program is a year long, and there's six men, there's six women, there are people of color, people of different sexual orientation, people of different geographies, and all are at inflection points in their career and are high performers and high potential. And it's a more intimate way to say to a colleague, we care deeply about your future, uh, and we're going to uh, invest the time and effort to help you think about some of the issues and challenges, develop a personal leadership philosophy, and some of the other things that go with it. Uh, and, and a little bit to the point that Joey was making before, what I find with my female colleagues, I often find myself reinforcing to them that there's nothing they can do because they're so much more talented than the male colleagues are. But they have this natural reluctance not to take on more responsibility because they don't think they're 100% prepared for it. Whereas the men in the room would raise their hand after they were kind of 10 or 15% ready and say, of course I can do that job. <laughs> and so part of what I'm trying to do is to make sure that we encourage uh, and invest for the future, understanding from their point of view that they know they're important to us and that we can strike the right balance with some of the life issues we have to deal with. We have a very good pipeline. We recruit about 5,000 people a year in different parts of our business around the world, uh, the, particularly in those coming out of university and college. It's about 50-50 male-female. Our problem tends to present itself between kind of six and eight or nine years in the company as they take on more responsibility, and they wrestle with some of these life decisions that Joey referred to earlier. My objective always with a female colleague who goes on maternity leave is to create an environment for them before they go where they can't even consider not coming back to work because they're so valuable to what we do going forward. And I think our record is getting a little bit better, but it's persistence that pays in these things and making sure that we're listening and understanding what the challenges are and creating an environment where we can successfully address those challenges going forward. So you lead by example, you set a culture. How about accountability? How do you ensure 
that your middle managers are also doing what you're preaching. So, so may I? Please, both. Uh, so we have 17 separate business units that each year present to me a diversity and inclusion strategy which is built around recruiting, retention, development, and kind of a fourth category, which is try a new idea, see if it works. If it does, we'll socialize it across the firm, and if it doesn't, throw it away and start all over again, and they have the latitude to be able to do that. I then meet with them after six months and evaluate performance against those plans. Uh, in their annual performance evaluation, consideration goes into how well they did in meeting the metrics and targets that they've set for their DNI strategy. And in some cases, their compensation is adjusted either upward or downward as a result of that. The other thing that we do is we make sure that when we're recruiting for senior positions, that they can't basically go forward and offer anyone a job unless they can prove they've dealt with a diverse slate of colleagues. And, and making sure that, that we have the inputs to be able to su have them support that they really have been dealing with a diverse slate of employees, of, of candidates for the position. So things like that, where we try and make it perfectly clear to them that this is a very, very important part of their human capital strategy, every bit as much as their sales strategy or technology or infrastructure or whatever it may be. Joey, accountability? Uh, transparency, again, uh, I'll give you two examples. One is, Again, our company is divided into, um, we have headquarters and then we have 18 subsidiaries in China. And it's our tradition that whenever we have a new, new employee, at all level, at all level, every month they will come forward to the entire leadership team and introduce themselves, every single one. Uh, we'll have full visibility what's the ratio between men and women. But at the same time, really address the diversity issue uh, from the bottom of heart. Actually, in some department, we, are, we have the reverse issue. We have too few men. <laughs> like marketing department, we will have 80, 90% women. Then our goal is when we recruit people, we will look at, like, could we have more men, please? In Chinese, we also have, have a saying, <laughs> when you have the men and women, you know, in, in roughly a sort of similar proportion working together, it, it feels not as hardworking. It, it, it's better that way. Um, so so we, we have the reverse, we, we have to address the re reverse challenge. Um, we have to, uh, and, and we do it because the visibility is transparency. Every month we can see it. Yeah. We have less than one minute. I want to do the second polling question. Okay, you ready? How long will it take for gender equality to be achieved? One, 20 years, two, 50 years, three, 200 years, and God forbid, four, 202 years. What about five, 5,000 years? <laughs> 5,000 years? <laughs> you guys need to be educated on gender equality. <laughs> it's a wrong answer. The answer is? 202 years. 202 years. We can do better than that. Both Joey and Peter, what is the one thing we need to do to address this issue? I mean, here we are talking about gender equality, but obviously we're not making the kind of strides we should be making. Yeah, it's not a one-answer question. There's just so many things that have to be done. Uh, and uh, in doing so many different things or, or things together to create the environment where people want to be long-term partners in your business. And so, so I don't think it's just one thing. I wish it were that easy, but it's not. The reason why I say 5,000 years is because Chinese has very proud 5,000 years. It only took us 4,900 years to, to get to the point that women can have a right to work. So we are not doing too badly in the last 100 years, so let's recognize that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but going forward, what else can be done? Um, First, don't give up, because there's no other alternative. Um, don't give up. 